to the last Games Now lecture of the autumn term. Uh, good to have you here. And um, we will continue in spring, but now, before Christmas, we are happy to still have Jonas Lark so from Next Games. And uh, as many of you know, the Walking Dead No Man's Land has come out just quite recently, so this is a very now thing in the industry and we are really happy to have the production lead of Next Games here with us today. Welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, my topic today is making a successful game based on a license. Uh, but what it really means for me is how to best use an existing narrative to deliver a game. So uh, you might replace the game here by, by some other medium and the license doesn't have to be an entertainment mega brand. It could be something else. This is mostly about adapting something already existing into a new form and being successful at that. Um, let's take a look at um, licensed games in US iPhone top grossing games top 100. So when you're thinking about licensed games, um, there tends to be uh, the assumption that it is somehow an easy way to get to the top of the charts and get tons of attention. But if you look at the actual charts, that isn't really the case. Um, up here, we've got all the games in the US iPhone top grossing games top 100 list uh, as of 22nd November um, this year. So what, a week ago, two weeks ago. And um, what you can see here is that we got um, games based on other games, we got sports titles, something I'm calling mega brands. So basically uh, brands that are so big that they, that they can't be nailed down to a single source anymore. So fans for these mega brands may be coming from anywhere people are familiar with them even if uh, they are not fans themselves. And uh, if you can count to 18 you are going to notice that uh, there are 18 games on the on the chart. So that's 18 licensed games out of 100. So that means that 82 percentage of the top 100 grossing games um, are there on their own merits and not thanks to a license of any sort. And arguably some of these games even don't really need the license. For example Hearthstone um, is not popular because it's based on Warcraft but certainly Blizzard's marketing muscle has helped there. Uh, what we can see here, however, is that the game series really work. The majority of these licensed games are based on other games. And this just means that um, these games have an established fan base that's ready to pick up uh, whatever new you're putting out. So you have to do much less work to sell the game's idea. People already know what it's about, so it's easier to pick up. Um, what may be surprising is that movies are nowhere to be seen except for very long running movie series, Star Wars, Marvel, and the games are not based on any specific movie. They're rather based on the whole mega brand of Star Wars or the Marvel properties. And these IPs transcend their original medium. Uh, people don't really think about the Marvel movies when they're thinking about the Marvel universe. They may be coming in from whatever angle happens to be familiar to them. So if this is the case, why are studios interested in licensing a property to make a game about it in that case? Uh, this impulse can come from either the party owning the property or the game studio that's going to develop or publish the game. License holders often see games as part of marketing, especially in the past, but even today. Uh, they see it as added exposure, just more ways for fans to interact with the brand. And it's all part of the marketing push to get as many people into spending money into the brand. Uh, and brand here being typically a movie, but it could be something else as possible. But game studios developing these games see this the other way around. Uh, they believe that the known brand, let's say a movie, uh, with its own marketing push is going to get them over the barrier of unfam unfamiliarity um, on the download charts. Uh, helping them to stand out from the crowd. So you effectively loan a name so that people pay attention to you. Um, but today we don't really care about this whole games as marketing angle. That doesn't really relate to making successful games. The brand as exposure angle is worth talking about at length 
in our case. Um, licensing does not guarantee success, but it does give you a plan you can follow. And it is that plan that I'm going to be covering today. Uh, no doubt, if we had shipped the exact same game as we did a couple of months ago without the Walking Dead brand, I don't think we'd be anywhere. This is the case even though I believe that the game is actually very good and worth the player's continued time and attention. Uh, and the best case scenario would be that we would need to build the game for at least a year to see if we were able to incrementally grow the audience to see if we could finally get anywhere or not. Mm. Speaking of going anywhere, let's consider degrees of success. As of this month, Next Games is 65 people plus, plus contractors, uh, bringing the total to somewhere around 75. We can't afford to wait a year to see if a game is going to work or not. Our staff is burning through a lot of money in wages every single month. We need to know that we are doing the right things to be successful every single month. So this means that big studios have to make big bets. We can't be content if we are unable to hit, let's say, the US top 50 grossing, which we did with No Man's Land uh, a month after launch. Uh, obviously, staying up there in the top 50 or preferably even higher, continuing to be relevant is the real challenge. Uh, but getting there in the first place gets you a position in the race. Then we can go to work. We could have, of, of course, taken a smaller risk uh, with No Man's Land, uh, not putting in so many man months. I did a quick estimate, which put it um, around 400 man months to make the releasable game. Uh, but then we would run the risk of not being worthy of the brand promise. We believe in high quality at Next Games and so-called high production values. And essentially, our games should feel like premium products, something worthy. So for us, it really wasn't any choice. We had to go big. So to get there, to be successful, what you have to do in order to make a successful game based on a licensed property, you have to be good, you have to be true, and you have to find the right market. Um, before we go on, I feel it's important that you know me to properly judge what I'm going to tell you today and uh, maybe put it in the right context and figure out where I'm coming from. I have a college level polytechnic um, education on something we call design management way back in 2001. Uh, design management is all about brand building, marketing and communication, directing creative work, in other words, which um, very much applies to producing video games. Uh, I then worked with other people's brands for years. I started with Finlandia Vodka uh, and then moved on to making insurance, advertising, politics, cruise lines, Canon consumer imaging, uh, so cameras, printers and scanners. Uh, a side note about how the world changes. When I jumped ship from marketing at Canon to making video games, that felt like a very dangerous leap. Uh, back then, Canon was an extremely stable company and games certainly are not. They still are not. Uh, but then the same year I jumped, which was 2007 to 2008, the iPhone happened and digital camera sales just evaporated. Suddenly, it made much more sense to focus on content uh, instead of shipping physical products. So yeah, the iPhone happened, I jumped to games. Um, I didn't start with mobile though. Um, in games, I've worked with um, big license holders and in three different studios, Bugbear, Remedy and Next Games. I've shipped a reinterpretation of a classic loved franchise, Ridge Racer Unbounded. Mm, touring with the game, by the by, I actually dreaded that I might get punched by an angry fan. Uh, while I'm very proud of what we did with Unbounded, we certainly went down a different trail with our own take for the series. Um, my first studio, Bugbear, had a successful game series, series which we actively worked with uh, on expanding, called Flat Out. Um, I've pitched a dozen or so game and movie and TV show, show and personality and sports licenses. Uh, typically, when you want to pitch something, you have to go pretty deep into the, uh, into the product, working on the product vision and the high-level design uh, to even get a shot at a deal, even if the project never comes through. Um, 
Over the last year, I've worked on one of the biggest things on TV right now, AMC's The Walking Dead, and helped deliver a successful game based on that series, The Walking Dead No Man's Land. So to begin with, your game has to be good. Making a good game should be obvious, but far too often you see studios putting together whatever questionable content to seize an opportunity on a property that they managed to secure. This is the reason for the low expectations on the quality of licensed games. No amount of brand appeal can make up for failings in interaction. It's very easy to see why this happens. Getting any sort of license is very difficult. It's hard to reach the right people to even get to discuss your licensing ambitions and then to get them to agree to a meeting. People are rarely willing to sign out their properties without knowing who they're actually dealing with. Then you have to convince them that you have a good case to even start discussing the possibility. This is mostly on the strength of your team and a proven track record. Very likely you won't have anything at hand to convince them with. And then if you get that far, then you negotiate. Licensing terms can be very complex. Uh, there are often more parties than just the two most obvious one in, ones involved. If the property you're after is popular to any degree, there are already existing deals in place that have to be taken into account. The terms are likely some combination of cash and royalties and different kinds of actions you're required to take, such as marketing initiatives. Um, and somewhere along the way, you also need to start developing the game. Unless you can dedicate people to handle the deal, the licensing deal, without any effect on the people actually developing the game, being able to focus on the game itself can be next to impossible. When the deal is finally in place, your game should already be pretty far along. Uh, thus the licensing versus making games. They are competing for your attention. Then when you are deep in development, um, it can turn out that the people you've been dealing with when getting the deal in place are different from the people actually overseeing the production. You can run into all sorts of trouble with the new people feeling like they need to leave their mark on the game once they finally join the project, all in the name of the license. We did not have these issues with The Walking Dead. AMC has very good people in proper positions taking care of things. And we at Next Games can afford to do the same, all without hampering the team making the game. Let's talk about some of the things on uh, No Man's Land that I am proud of. We took a big risk with the game's genre. It's a tactical turn-based RPG. Well, for all you old school PC gamers out there, um, it's an RPG in the mobile uh, game space sense. You have characters and you care about their stats and you're leveling them up, up thus an RPG. Um, on the App Store, we feature strongly in the strategy and RPG uh, categories, both of which fit us fine. Now, there are no successful turn-based tactics RPGs out there on mobile. There are good games of that so sort for sure, uh, but none that have found a sizable, enduring following. And again, this is success as we define it. Your degree may vary. Thus, we could not look at an established model to figure out how to do this. Instead, we looked back at games we love and figured out how to bring these across to mobile. On the right, we obviously have XCOM. Um, does anybody know what the game on the left is? None. That would be Julian Golub's Laser Squad all the way from 88, Commodore 64. So we played a lot of the competition to figure out uh, what they did wrong. Why were they not successful or more successful as the case may be? Um, in the end, our verdict was that the other turn-based tactics RPG type games on mobile simply were not very good fits for mobile. When I joined the team a little under a year ago, in February this year, um, I had just one goal which I felt was paramount to making a good game with our chosen framework, mobile, turn-based tactics. It had to make sense on mobile. At that point, the team already had a very good turn-based tactics game in the Unity Editor view, played on the PC with a mouse. It had all the mechanics you might want from such a game, so like we were ready to take on XCOM or anything you care to mention. And from then on, we proceeded to make it fit the small screen. 
two big requirements arose from thinking hard about the target platform. One, uh, you had to be able to stop playing at any time and resume exactly where you left off. I had learned this from playing a lot of uh, Monster Strike and Puzzle and Dragons on mobile. Uh, a friend of mine likes to invoke the Starbucks test. If you can't play a meaningful session while waiting for your latte, you're doing it wrong. You might think resume anywhere is mostly a technical challenge, and a challenge it indeed is. Um, but the real problems lie with user interface and game design. In order to pass the Starbucks test, we need every single user input to be meaningful. That means that you have to be able to read the situation on the screen at a glance um, and then make a good, interesting move in just one input without context for whatever went down on previous turn. We don't rely on player memory for them to have fun with it. It might have been days since you last played and your next turn still has to make sense and feel good and be fun. Naturally, this also causes considerable problems for storytelling. Two, you can't fight the limits of the platform. Initially, we had something much closer to XCOM. This is an early prototype, um, or rather a mock-up of one. Um, large maps, multiple different actions for each character, weapons you could swap on the fly. But managing this all on a phone screen just wasn't very much fun. For all the freedom of expression and possibilities uh, this like more granular approach gave us, um, it limited your ability to actually enjoy the game. So instead of fighting the platform, we built our interaction for it. After a lot of trial and error, we came up with the so-called one-trick pony interaction. Gone was tap to choose active character, tap to choose action, tap to target, tap to confirm, and in with the single contextual swipe to do everything. We later added the charge ability for more tactical options, which does require a tap on the character's portrait to activate. I'm the first to admit that the swipe still has lingering targeting issues and the sort, especially on the smaller screens, but what it does is make the play, play feel fluid. The game flows when you're just swiping for every single action, instead of stopping to tap everything. To further improve on this um, flow or fluidity, um, we added the simultaneous actions. Um, you can chain your command so that your whole team moves at once, making for dynamic play that, that really belies the game's actually turn-based nature. This was a result of realizing that in many of the other tactics RPGs out there, the pacing just felt all wrong. You were waiting for things to happen most of the time, and just, that just wasn't any fun. As a side note, making a turn-based game with shambling zombies as your only antagonist doesn't exactly help with speeding up your pacing. Animators were sure for in, in for a challenge, and uh, for a very long time in development, the zombies also moved one at a time, which made for really glacial pacing. It's a lot better now. Another big thing uh, is that you can only see so much on the screen at once. So we made our maps a lot smaller and easier to take in. They only ever scroll in one direction, so you're going from left to right or right to left, uh, never up or down. Mm. And uh, this means that you only have to pan around to figure out where you're going and where the enemies are, are coming from. Again, a single glance should be enough to decide what to do next. Um, the graphics up here are what we call backgrounds. Each is used for multiple missions, so there's one to three screens at a time. So you don't see this much at a single time. You see like maybe one third, one fourth of that. And uh, all the level design elements like cover and loot boxes and so forth are placed on top of these, which is why they look kind of empty like this. But the point being that um, you can't get lost here. You're only going left or right. And um, I don't believe that we've sacrificed anything by limiting ourselves in this way. We now have maps that are seven squares in height and one to two screens in width. In our first published maps, we had a bit of backtracking. Uh, which felt confusing, especially if you've been away from the game between turns. Those are now condensed uh, to eliminate eventless turns where you're just walking around. That's no fun, again. And we are now thinking about what is the limit of meaningful tactical space with our game's rules. Perhaps we could make the maps even smaller still. If we can, I, I genuinely think that it would lead to even stronger gameplay.
So supposing that you have a good game, is that enough? No, we come to point two, it has to be true. A consultant question would be, how to best integrate an IP to a free-to-play mobile game? Yes, I, I know that sounds horrible, but that is actually how I'm used to speaking. And it does make, make sense for me. However, that's a form of othering and we shouldn't really do that. Um, forget about free-to-play for now and forget about mobile as well. We are past that for now. What we're discussing now has to do with any sort of adaptation of an existing experience to a new medium. So the actual question becomes how to best use an existing narrative to deliver a game. Because that's what intellectual property and brands really are. They're shared stories. They're narratives. They're something that people care about. Every one of you has some sort of reaction to Vader up there. I don't need to tell you that it's Star Wars. Uh, or what the story is about, you already assign some sort of meaning to it. On some level, even if you're not a Star Wars fan, you have a reaction, you care. And in order to be successful with, the, with your game adaptation, uh, you have to be worth that caring. Taking that caring and then reciprocating it and using the resulting circle of love to carry your game is what this is all about. Now, it's never been enough to just make a good game, as, as I've sometimes heard people claim, um, and even less so today. Not to undermine making good games in any way, every released game is a miracle and every good game uh, even more so. But that does not guarantee success on any level. You need someone to pay attention to what you're doing and to care about it. That's the goal. Being noticed and being worthy of the player's time and continued attention is very, very hard. This is my iPhone's main screen. You're not just fighting games that are your direct competition, as you very often tend to think when you're developing the game and figuring out like what is your competition. You're actually fighting all games, especially everything that your audience, your target audience already has downloaded. They're going to make a decision each day whether to keep playing your game. But even worse, you're also fighting everything else the player might be doing on their device. Netflix and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. My social group, seen here, um, is what I mostly do on my phone. And all of that is competing with my game time. To get somewhere in there, to get the player to spend some time with you, you need relevance that can compete with your audience's real-life connections and human interactions. The Walking Dead, the brand, helps with all of that. The brand keeps itself relevant by being on TV every week, by advertising, by its complex web of interconnected products and channels and media. When you're on Twitter, The Walking Dead is there with you. Uh, this is all like from a couple of minutes of The Walking Dead Twitter feeds. There's a lot going on. Um, same on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. There's Walking Dead content or products for most sorts of situations you might find yourself in. The comic book creators are talking about it, as are the fans and the actors, the Hollywood media, AMC, Fox, that distributes um, The Walking Dead outside of the United States. Um, you've got tons of ways to connect with the brand if you're a fan. And all of this helps in keeping the brand top of mind and thus it gives us, as the games developers, a way in whenever people unlock their phones and look for something to do and see our icon in there. The IP you're building puts on a great deal of expectation on you. If you're doing Jurassic Park, there better be nice dinosaurs in there. If you're doing James Bond, you better have Daniel Craig's face and poses down pat. Uh, while that expectation can give you lots of leeway elsewhere, when delivered on, deliver you must, or you won't have anything to build on. Working on these details, like getting everything to look just right, um, is very time consuming. It requires a lot of attention that could also be used on, uh, like we like to say, making a great game. We only feature one of the show's actors in our game, Norman Reedus, who plays Daryl Dixon, seen up here. There's very good reasons for featuring him specifically. 
He's, pop he's very popular. His character is conveniently running about on his own, so he can plausibly guest star in the game. And he's done similar things in the series, helping other groups survive like he does in the game with a player's group. If we were to feature more of the show's characters, the game would probably have to be about those specific characters due to the amount of attention that we would be giving them. You can't cut corners here. The fans will notice and they will correctly deduce that you don't care about the brand as much as they, they do and thus they will stop caring about you. So instead of specific characters and their stories, we chose to deliver on The Walking Dead's core fiction. Get a group together and survive in the zombie apocalypse. Um, so the question becomes for the player, how would you do in Rick's groups, sorry, Rick's boots uh, leading your own survivor group? So we wanted the player to make their own story. Like we do tell a narrative in the game uh, to bring you along and to introduce new concepts one at a time. But the big picture is what's in the player's head revolving around their own party. So we put the focus on having a party you, ca you can assemble that resembles the show's cast. Telltale took the same approach with their own comic book adaptation. They came up with their, their own thing and that liberates you from keeping in step with the source materials fiction. Um, but you can still echo what the fans already know and expect from the property. Uh, Scopeless Road to Survival, which is also based on the comic books, not the show, um, does feature famous characters from the books, which is something they can more easily do, uh, working with drawn characters and not real life actors. Our characters are generated on the fly, but their appearances and abilities are very closely based on what you've already seen on TV. Our scout class is basically Glenn from TV. Our soul wielding warrior is Michonne. Our revolver waving shooter is Rick. Mm. Our game's cast is based on the TV show's entire cast, not then on any specific actors, but the overall vibe. The show's people are by and large ordinary people and so are ours. Going for these um, realistic depictions of just barely surviving people of all ages and backgrounds was not easy on the small screen, but I'm really proud of what we achieved here. It's a unique cast. For one thing, we've got plenty of old people, which is practically never seen in games. And the players seem to love them. So if it's not the show's storyline, because we're asking the player to write their own, um, or the characters, again, we're asking the player to create their own cast, what does make it part of the Walking Dead brand? Our game is built around combat, so we are not really big on character drama anyway. Instead, we focused on staying true to the show's atmosphere and themes. This is a McFarlane toys playset of the prison setting from the TV series. Um, there are a lot of obvious things to do when you're working on an existing narrative. You look at all the trappings and take as many as you can into your game. The world, the music, how everything looks. Um, up next is a trailer of our next update, showcasing the quarry location seen in the latest season of the show. out in the very near future. Now, all of this work to make everything look and feel really similar to the source is obvious to anybody like working on a licensed game, but it's very time consuming. And in many cases, we wondered if it's actually worth all the extra effort to make it really in line with the show. Um, but it absolutely is. Uh, the fans can always tell. In addition to, the, to these like backgrounds, which we already looked at, like the quarry in the upcoming update, there's also show costumes and props like weapons and stuff. We are making virtual versions of making sure that the fans are rewarded for paying attention. Like we don't even 
call out attention to like specific weapons or whatever. But um, many of the fans are going to notice that, hey, this is actually something I saw on TV last week and they're going to really appreciate it for that. That said, it really is not easy. Choosing photorealism as our approach and a largely grey and brown series as our subject didn't really set us up for easy small screen success. So how is this going to be visually appealing? How is it going to be readable especially? Um, you should really consider how you're going to adapt your source material visually to work on mobile. It wasn't straightforward at all. And we more or less decided that it's going to work and then worked on it until it did. Uh, without artists of the caliber that we have at Next Games, this could have been a disastrous approach to take, but luckily I feel like it worked out very well. Uh, the following is a 30 second TV spot. Don't you get it? This is it now. Everybody you knew before is dead. There's just us and there's them. You gotta get by on your own now. Stay human. Survive. <laughs> Download now from the App Store and Google Play. We did our title sequence in the game as if it was a part of the TV show. It's a big part of the show's identity. And the team music alone, heard in the background there in the advert you just saw, played for just a few bars when you load up the game, is a major win. It immediately brings the fans into the world. The rest of the music has been composed for the game, but we tried to stay true to the show, um, and we went for a movie score style instead of something more game-like. It wasn't cheap or easy, um, but without it the game would feel like a lesser adaptation. Then having one of the show's stars, uh, so Norman Reedus, uh, doing the voiceovers in the advertisements and, and so forth helps so much. The fans, fans immediately connect with the characters they love just by hearing the voice. Um, even though we got surprisingly many complaints that why did we use an imitator and not the actual Norman Reedus, that is the actual Norman Reedus, I can, I can um, assure you. We have photographic evidence. Uh, fair warning, next up is some animated gore. Violence is a really big thing for The Walking Dead. Um, the Walking Dead is one of the, if not the, most violent shows out there and we expect the fans to expect the game to be in line with that. Uh, thanks to our far removed camera in the game, you see things pretty small on the screen, like you're looking at things basically from a top-down view so you don't get too intimate with everything. Um, so we can afford to go over the top with the violence without it feeling too gruesome. That said, with buckets of blood spraying from gunshots and heads rolling from sword swings, this is not a kid's game. And how could it be, uh, being based on such a violent show? If we were to sanitize it in order to go for a wider audience, uh, not accustomed to the show's uh, intensity, that would go against staying true to the source and again alienate the show fans. We, ha we have actually added an, an option to turn off the blood effects uh, to give the choice for anyone preferring it. Um, we had some non-show fans playing the game complaining that they love everything but the gore, so now there is an option to do without if, if you would prefer that. Uh, the combat animation uh, seeks to evoke the same sort of feeling you get in the show. Making the combat feel intense despite being turn-based is largely down to the animation and pacing. Uh, we've looked at the signature moves from the show and replicated most of those beheading katana strikes and knife stabs to the head, posing with revolvers and so forth. The walker movement, like how the zombies shamble, required a fair bit of trial and error to get right without feeling too slow. Now, watching a TV show's drama and playing a game based on that drama are very different experiences. Instead of looking at put what happened in the show in the game, we are looking at what could the player do that's something they can relate to from the show. And those things, verbs, if you will, uh, for us are building a defensible camp for safety and growing your numbers with able survivors. Our 
character growth becomes literal growth. We don't give the player character, the players like character drama per se, uh, but we build the game around the mechanical arcs of the characters and the way they play together across the classes to make effective combat groups. You get all these satisfying character arcs, um, even though it's all numbers and play capabilities instead of character driven conflict. And that may sound like bullshit to you um, if you're very story centric, but I do believe that the players actually experience it this way. Let's say that we didn't have the character growth uh, and the interplay ac across the cl classes and the focus on forming effective groups. I think we'd have a very tough time delivering anything like the show, no matter the amount of character dialogue we'd throw in there. In combat, uh, we've taken on the show's focus on sound attracting walkers. Uh, there's this tension of do I need to use a gun or not, that's always present. And we really wanted to bring that across even though the accepted wisdom in game design is that you shouldn't apply penalty mechanics to core player interaction. So like when you're using a gun it doesn't sound like a good idea, you should like um, sort of count points uh, against the player for doing that. Um, so we added the threat mechanic. Every time you shoot Another walker is added to the next wave, uh, seen at the bottom here. Uh, we called it affectionately the monster closet during development. When we did that, the combat immediately started feeling more like the walking dead. Using guns makes noise and that brings more walkers to the fight. It's a player choice, perfectly aligned with the brand. Even if in most situations it's not tactically that that important. You're rarely in a situation where like the incoming threat is like actually a threat to your very existence. Um, it still carries weight and more importantly it reinforces the feel of being in the show's world. It's meaningful interaction. Consequences is a really big thing in the show and something we knew that we had to integrate in the game. Uh, we are not doing multiple choice dialogue or any sort of narrative player driven drama, so our consequences had to be mechanical. That's generally better in games anyway, people really care about the interaction. And that brought us to consider permanent death. Death is a big thing in the series and for some time we tried to make uh, a biting and infection mechanic working. We, but it felt that it was unfun because staying through to the series there was absolutely nothing you could do about a bite. You were done for. If a walker got to you and bit you, you would die. Um, so there was no choice involved. You, you had just gotten unlucky, unlucky and had to live and die with it. And um, except uh, we made you live with the situation for some time before the infected character would turn into one of the undead. So instead we turned it around and made it a player choice. Permanent death only occurs uh, when you go out on specially marked optional deadly missions. You're taking a chance with the characters you choose, risking their lives for a chance at better loot. Um, we actually go one step further and impose a penalty to fleeing too. Uh, you have to leave someone behind condemn condemning them to die if you decide to run for it. So you can't go on a deadly mission try it on for a size and decide, nah, I'm not going to do this and run, we still force you to leave somebody behind. In most cases what happens is that you realize that you're outnumbered and going to end up in a bad way for your whole team, so instead you flee and choose one of your guys to be left behind and die. You make the choice and you're responsible for it. To me this feels so much more powerful than a more or less random lethal result of a combat or worse still, a cutscene with a character dying because the writer said so. Even then we were really hesitant about permadeath, as it's just not seen in mobile games meant for mass market appeal. You can choose to invest real money in your characters and then lose it all with a bad call. When we discussed this with AMC, they were fully on board, uh, much to our surprise, in the end actually talking us into it. They felt that it was so true to the brand and right they are. We've actually had very few complaints about permadeath, even with the players now able to spend money to get rare characters and potentially lose them forever. I believe this plays into many people enjoying that sort of thrill. It's a gamble. I certainly play the deadly missions all the time and find it much more engaging than the less risky missions. 
um, related, we added a building that only displays your dead survivors' names and stats. The memorial, we call it. Um, as you advance in the game, uh, some of your survivors will be too weak to fight on, and you're expected to retire them, uh, which frees up inventory space and removes the character from the game. Uh, we found that some players prefer to kill off their favorite weak survivors instead, rather than retire them, just to get a permanent record of their story in the game. To me, personally, permadeath is the thing that makes this The Walking Dead. Your mechanics always tell a story. They are the verbs that the player uses to walk their path through your game. They really matter and you have to make sure that your verbs match your IP. Let's think of a fictional example. I love Pacific Rim. If I were to make a game about Pacific Rim, it would have two pilots at its core and their emotional link would be a core game mechanic. The actual second-to-second -second mechanics or the interaction might be whatever, it could be turn-based tactics or it could be a fighting game or a card collecting game or a real-time strategy game or whatever. But if it wasn't built around it, that emotional tie between the two pilots in the mecha that they're sharing, it would feel false to me as a fan. Uh, crucially, it wouldn't have to be uh, the specific characters from the movie, even though I would expect to see all the giant robots and monsters that I love from the movie. Um, in this case, the trappings and the scenario feel to me much more important than the specific characters and their story from a game adaptations point of view. Mm, the mobile game of Pacific Rim that, that was released back when the movie released um, has none of these things. It's a simple, decently built um, fighting game of Jaegers fighting Kaiju. Uh, in one-on-one -on -one matches. While, yes, that's on the surface uh, what happens in the movie, it's not what the movie is about. And while you may scoff at that, uh, the thematic appeal and significance of a work is absolutely core to its success. Fans may be unable to tell you that this is what they actually care about, but the truly successful properties always have teams that resonate with the fans, and you want to carry those teams through to your game in order to be successful. My favorite example of a licensed game treating the property right comes all the way from 1988, the era of really terrible licensed games. Can anybody identify the licensed game on the left? That would be Transformers 1986, Denton Designs and Ocean. Uh, the first time I realized as a child that not all video games are the best thing in, in existence. It is really, really bad. On the right is another terrible license game, Miami Vice, also 1986, Canvas and Ocean. Um, however, Samurai Warrior, The Battles of Usagi Yojimbo by Beam Software 1988, uh, Commodore 64 here, uh, takes the samurai team and makes the player approach the game in a thoughtful way. You had to think about when to draw a sword and never to draw first if you wanted to hold on to your good karma. You would be polite to peasants um, all the while being on the lookout for ninjas in disguise. The game felt like a spiritual journey with the titular Samurai Rabbit. It's a bafflingly progressive game for its day and really matches the comic book it's based on. Um, it helps that it had great looks and a soundtrack that still works. The new Usagi Yojimbo game, Way of the Ronin, made for mobile uh, last year by Happy Giant, uh, is a simple, old-fashioned side-scrolling beat-em-up. Mm, it looks very nice indeed, but to me as a fan, um, that's basically all it offers. It, it looks great, you get to have fun with, with your favorite characters, you get to visualize all these cool fights, but the, the old game from 1988 was a true part of the Usagi Yojimbo experience for me. Being true to your source means that your game has to make sense in the context of the brand. The Walking Dead is all about the fantasy of post-apocalyptic survival. There's a great deal of what if in its appeal. So naturally our things come under the same scrutiny. Two examples of things we had difficulty nailing have to do with our camp. Our campsite, seen here, uh, works as the player's headquarters. Uh, this is uh, the concept out of the final camp. Um, the campsite is built around an abandoned radio station. 
And the reason is that we needed to find a location that was far away from major cities. As we hadn't built the city environment sets yet, we could go there. Um, and defensible, thus fortified after the apocalypse and yet abandoned for some reason so the player could take them over, take it over. And the radio station fulfilled this criteria being a place to potentially reach other survivors. We went through quite a few iterations uh, and the reasons why the others didn't stick were all to do with the brand, in brand fiction. So like we couldn't be in the middle of the woods because it had been established in the series by now that um, it's unsafe to be like without a fortification of some sort. The other thing is we've discussed adding a walker cage type structure to the camp, sort of like uh, what you can see in the governor's town in the series. Uh, the construction, appearance and location of these cages in the camp was far from trivial. Again, it had to make sense in the fictional world, even if for us it's merely a front for a game mechanic, you could say a glorified button to open a menu. The significance of such a, such a structure and how it's presented is a big thing for the fans. As an example, it would, would have been easiest for us to place it inside the camp walls, but um, in the show's fiction, they never do it that way. It's, it's seen as too dangerous. Even the uh, rather deranged governor saw it fit to hold his walkers way outside of the actual community. So we basically have to do the same if we want to do that sort of thing. Being through means that you can't just add whatever and hope that no one notices. We are under considerable pressure to add new combat options into the mix to keep the game fresh for veteran players and being based on the real world with realistic zombies such as they are makes that very hard. We can't just slap on a new element like ice zombies like you could do in a fantasy game. Your audience has a big impact on what kind of game you might make. When we first showed No Man's Land around, people, myself included, were surprised that it was so hardcore, so involved. It demands thinking and attention. You can't play it half fast or you're going to get in trouble. Now, with a big TV show, you're automatically thinking of a low barrier to entry, um, making your game as accessible as possible, but it's important to know what kind of game you're best at making. Your game will always look like the team developing it. And once we had started down the turn-based strategy road, we had to make the best possible such game. Classically, you're expected to make your game as accessible as possible. You're expected to make it work for the widest possible audience, um, but the right way to make a turn-based strategy game work well is not to make it as accessible as possible. What strategy needs to be is meaningful. As a fan of turn-based games myself, nothing turns me off as fast as inconsequential moves and turns where nothing happens. Your decisions have to matter. So instead of making non-meaningful action, we turn to thinking how we could build a resolution space that would engage but not overwhelm. Again, it came back to making sure that each turn is self-contained. You can always see what's going on and decide what to do next without any extra information. You have to be true to your game as well as your brand. So what makes for a good game brand? I'd argue you can take almost anything and make a sweet game for its specific audience. The trick is finding something that has a wide enough appeal to justify the effort. For mobile, you have some special considerations. To be truly successful, you need to have something the players can play for months at end. Um, that, that means that it can't be very content heavy. Um, because you need repeatable action, you need collection, something that you don't have to build from scratch like every single time you want to add some more of that into the game. You need a tangible, interesting meta game to get engrossed in. The players need the room to find their own goals and to play with the game their own way. Again, collections and character building, different combinations to try. And the game needs to grow as they play. There should be more options and more things to try and do as you go on, not less. Spending time and money on the game should always expand on the palette, uh, giving you more to do and not run out of things to do. That means that the ideal property has quite a bit of width. For example, 
Star Wars and Marvel are great properties for game adaptations because of all the characters and interconnected factions and plot lines that they have running through them. Batman on his own, on the other hand, is also pretty good, um, but so focused on just one character that it forces you to go deep, not wide. And Rocksteady did exactly this with their successful Batman series on the consoles and PC, Arkham Asylum et al. Many players exclaimed simply, I am Batman, when asked what is so cool about the game. And that's all you need, that's instant connection with the fans. Not that it's easy to pull off, everything in the Batman games builds to that, the physicality, the empowering combat, the gadgets giving you more options to behave like Batman. On the other hand, Glue's Kim Kardashian game is still doing very well, and that's all about the single person and their famously shallow world. So how come it works so well? It's a good game to start with. It's based on two previous iterations, so the developer has had time to figure out what works. Uh, but the reason it connects and works so well is because Glue has understood the appeal of Kim Kardashian, the product, the brand, the personality. It's all about projecting yourself into a glamorous life, a sort of TV and media consumers role-playing game. So the game does exactly that. You're a fresh face in Hollywood and Kim shows you around and you build yourself into a brand, competing with other celebrities for attention. Again, verbs, putting the player into the brand, letting them tell their own story. When you do all this successfully, give the players the right verbs, allow them to connect with the brand's core teams, let them tell their own story, your players become probably more engrossed in the game's world than you as the developer are. We were surprised by some of our first user testing results. We had fans of the show come in uh, to play the game without uh, us explaining anything about how it works. They immediately picked up on all the small details we got right in the music and the environment, and they reacted very strongly to Darius' appearance and noted which color his crossbow bolts were and so forth, as expected. But when we asked them to make a simple game choice, they agonized over it. In the game you can go on the radio to call out for more survivors to join your ranks. Some of, someone will then show up and you need to decide whether to let them join your group or not. The first state is here on the left and the resulting uh, decision is on the right. Um, making this call of whether to add a new survivor to your roster was not straightforward at all to these new players. In the show, this is always a very big deal, deciding whether someone can stay with the group, if they're worth the trust or not. They wanted more information. Who is this new person? Might they hurt me? Can I trust them? How can I learn more about them? And none of this was expected. We were keen on just making sure that you have all the mechanical knowledge you need to make the decision of whether this is going to be a useful character to you or not. And when they accepted that this was all the information they were going to get, next they agonized over our verbs. That's right, the buttons on the screen, reject and accept. Mm. What happens when you reject someone? Do they go back out into the wasteland? Do they die? Might they get angry and come back to revenge? And none of these are things that actually exist in the game. Well, yet they don't. But it was all real to the players. The brand made it so. There would be consequences to their decisions about these characters. We probably should have realized that the fans are going to care about the characters and project all sorts of meaning to them. When you're aware of that, you can use it to your advantage. Let the fans imagine things. There's nothing wrong with that. Just don't contradict what they believe. Now, we did realize that trust was a major theme in the show, but we were planning to bring it into play later when you're dealing with other human players. It seems we could have made it a more core part of the game early on to be even more true to the brand. When the show is on, uh, we tell the players to tune in at night to watch the new episode. We also feature exclusive video clips from the previous week's episode and previews of the next week's episode in the game. AMC told us that the fans would love this sort of thing, but I didn't personally really believe it until seeing how many of our reviews on App Store actually called these elements out as a thing they specifically loved. Featuring all of that official content is a very big deal for the fans, even if it can feel superficial and not really game-related to us as the developers. 
But to the fan, it's all part of the same experience. They want to be involved in the world of The Walking Dead and all interaction with the brand plays a part. Even, telling, ask, even the game asking them to please go watch TV tonight. We also feature show costumes called outfits in the game that you can choose to replace your standard character's clothes with. It's a form of virtual cosplay as we don't feature the likenesses of the show actors, but we can see fans making their own versions of the show's cast using the game's tools. They also show weapons often seen only fleetingly in the show, but lovingly recreated in the game. And the most engaged fans will spot them and value them and have fun with them. Stepping outside of The Walking Dead for a moment, let's consider sports. Sports licenses are a very interesting case and somewhat separate from, from other sorts of licenses. EA is obviously doing great with their soccer and American football series FIFA and Madden, uh, as well as ice hockey with NHL. When you're playing these games, they go to great lengths to make the gameplay feel as if you were spectating the game on TV as a broadcast. Their realism is that of the TV spectator's realism. Madden is not a famous player, he's an NFL commentator. And it's a very wise way to approach this. I was at one point rather into MotoGP, watching every race on TV with great enthusiasm, and so I picked up the official game too. And it had none of the excitement and energy of the TV, TV show. Um, it looked and sounded all wrong. They were trying to do a simulation approach, which held close to zero appeal to me. I wanted a TV experience. It's not a very successful game series. Arguably the biggest part of choosing the right license property for your game is figuring out which IP has the sort of reach you need. How popular is it? What are the fans like? What, what other things are they into? As may be the case here, Coca-Cola. Um, what sort of gameplay might interest them? Are they already playing a comparable game? And if they are, is that competition or an opportunity for you? Some IPs are really saturated with games. They are, there are very good reasons why Star Wars and Marvel properties are so popular in games, but at the same time it's hard to stand out from the crowd. You might think that popular TV shows or movies would be good bets, but they come with a ton of caveats. Perhaps foremost is that TV and movies are tied to the calendar. You need to be out on the same day the new installment of the show or movie series is, or you're dead in the water. While that Hollywood marketing may be very lucrative, Hollywood spends insane amounts of money on, on marketing, like no other industry can compete. Um, it only lasts until the movie comes out and then you're on your own. And are people really going to love this movie so much that they want to continue spending time in its world? You won't know until the movie is out and that is a very big gamble to make when you're deciding where to spend your game developing money on. And this explains why games based on movie licenses uh, tend to be so hastily made. It doesn't make sense to invest a ton of money when the return on that investment is likely a one-off surge of customers and, per and purchases instead of an ongoing long tail uh, of a living product. So ask yourself what the license can do for you. What is their marketing reach like? How much are they spending on marketing? When? On which channels? Uh, what kind of audience are you going to reach? Is there meaningful overlap with the sorts of people you believe your game will do best with? How engaged are the fans? Are they so into the characters that there's cosplay all over the place? Do they write fan fiction? Are there Facebook groups for fans of given characters? Uh, how do they trend on Google and Twitter? For us, the big thing with The Walking Dead is all the TV advertising we are able to get with AMC and Fox now. Multiple ads every week when you're in the mood to interact with the brand in any way, watching it is huge for us. So should you license or not? Um, that really depends on your resources and what you're shooting for. Uh, to us it makes sense at, as Next Games as um, the competition for positions on the most downloaded list uh, is fought with ungodly amounts of money and any edge you can get is less risk in the big picture. There are elements of working with existing properties that actually help in making games. You get boundaries. 
the brand is about some things and any fan can tell you which things would not work with it. Uh, you get shortcuts. Fans assign meaning to many things in the properties world that you can easily and cheaply reference without having to come up with all sorts of background inf information and justification or meaning. Uh, in our case, we could easily jump to the beginning of the story at the terminus. All the fans will know what's going on. Non-fans won't know, but um, it saves us so much time on, on like exposure that it's, it's worth just jumping to where we want to be. Um, you get that caring audience that will at least grant you a look, if not a download or money. It all makes it so much easier. And you get significance. Your brand makes your game bigger and thus more worthy of the potential player's time. Finding just the right IP to make into a game is far from easy and the opportunity cost of getting into those negotiations to see what might or might not come out as a finished game a year or two down the line uh, is far from trivial. But then again, the same goes for pre-production in the dark with no idea of who will care about your game. Licensing takes away one of the big unknowns, who's going to care, but making games is still really hard. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions. Okay, let's see if this works. Yes, who's first? Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask about how you uh, chose this specific brand for this game and how kind of the process went that when do you start designing the game, like the mechanics and so on, whatever, and when do you choose the brand? Uh, I wasn't there when Nest Games initially picked the brand. The story goes that the uh, founders and the management uh, went on a retreat and to think about like what would be the ideal brand to choose. Like they had a strategy uh, picked out that they want to license something and at the same time develop something that uh, we would come up with on, on our own without the license, so two games. And for the license game that is basically went through the options like what would be the ideal brand and at the time The Walking Dead was just starting to really blow up in the US, uh, not so much globally yet at that point I think. And uh, they just felt like this is, this is like the, the ideal license, it just makes so much sense. And um, somebody knew somebody and we got into negotiations and basically just went for it. And uh, now we are the only um, licensed um, game based on the TV show. There are other options if you're into the comic books and ob ob obviously like for the fans it's all one big franchise but we are very much focused on the TV show. And um, development of the game started pretty much immediately and as I said the team was really into making strategy games and that felt like a good fit here so it just made sense to go with that. It hasn't really changed all that much over the like a couple of years that we've been making it. It's more or less what we started out to do. Yeah, so hello, I, I would like to ask about uh, uh, the Compass, Compass Point games. So can you share any, any um, upcoming uh, things about those, ga go those games regarding of like the East, South or North, uh, like versions of th th that game? Yes, so Compass Point West is our other game. I'm not really involved with that in any capacity beyond playing it on my phone and sometimes loaning the people developing that game into my team. Um, we are still continuing development of Compass Point West. I don't have any news of uh, other games in that series yet. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, obviously we're mostly tracking like how people are spending time and, and money on the game. There's nothing that we can deduce about their age from those statistics. Um, 
we know who likes us on Facebook. We are tracking that and that like um, that's very much in line with the show's viewership, which is uh, guys and girls. Um, well, they, they are mature up to 30s around. Uh, surprisingly many, many women. I think it, in the States it's close to 50-50. Can't remember the actual numbers. Um, no, I, I don't know like how many um, like um, two young kids are playing the game. I'm hoping not very many. Like we've been very upfront about not being a kids game. It's certainly not, not made for children and not suitable for children. Um, I haven't heard about any complaints. If there are any, um, then marketing hasn't or community hasn't passed them on to development team. Uh, yeah, no, not, not really aware. I'm, I'm hoping not, not too many. No, no. to ask about the, um, that the game being designed for mature aud audiences. Do you try to capitalize this on game mechanics by having more like mature mechanics like possibility of losing your characters and so mm. on? Uh, well, you, you, yes, you, you could say that, yeah. Um, so like knowing our audience, like we did bank on like um, appealing to people who already play like strategy games and are familiar with the concepts. So like we are not doing a great job in line, like in explaining all the basics. Like in some of the first tests, we ran into quite a few issues with people like not really understanding how turn-based like mechanics in general work. Like if you're not familiar with this sort of game, it, it looks kind of confusing because like everybody's standing still and they've got like their idle animation. So it's not like a freeze frame, but nobody's moving. And uh, when you move somebody, only that one guy moves and everybody else stays still. It, it looks pretty weird if you're not familiar with that. And um, I think we could do a much better job of like explaining all of that. But um, that being said, we've gone ahead and assumed that most of our audience is going to be familiar with that stuff already. Um, like we are like assuming with the show elements, that we're assuming that they're familiar with the show. So we're doing the same with the genre basically. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it is pretty demanding. So like we're wary of um, requiring too much from the player. So like playing the game should not feel exhausting unless maybe if, if you like you're going on a super difficult deadly mission and you're choosing to like take on this challenge for a few minutes. But in most cases you shouldn't feel like actually stressed out. It should feel meaningful but not exhausting. And uh, yeah, I, I think like there we are making assumptions that this is going to be a pretty mature audience who wants this sort of experience. Um, we have talked uh, quite a lot about borrowing ideas here on these lectures and uh, The Walking Dead is kind of unique product, but at the same time there are lots of uh, stuff about zombies, movies, other movies and other games. And while making a game on The Walking Dead, have you ever faced any problems with other developers making zombie games? Um, no, not, not really. Like um, obviously we play all the other Walking Dead games out there. Um, obviously we play like um, good turn-based strategy games to like make sure that um, we are doing all the, all the best practices and, and so forth. But um, no, I'm not really like concerned about competition. Like uh, yes, um, there are a ton of like, like, there's so much zombie content out there. Yes, so like if we were to make a, a game without a license, um, I would be extremely hesitant about making a zombie game. Like um, being lost in the mass would be a considerable problem. Um, but like being the number one IP out there makes things so much easier. It wasn't really a concern. Like we, are, we don't think of ourselves as like a zombie game. We, are, we think of ourselves as the game based on the worldwide number one uh, TV show. Okay, so I'm a bit interested in um, uh, including Daryl, a known character from, from the TV series, into this game. Um, because I'm thinking, I don't know, I haven't played the game yet, so I don't know how big his part is there. Is he just like an NPC type character? But I'm feeling that there could be some um, responses from the fans about including him in the game? Could you tell me a bit about that? Oh, yeah, for sure. Like the fan response to uh, Daryl Dixon's inclusion has been very positive indeed. He's a much loved character uh, in the series. And 
it, yeah, again, it, it just makes so much sense. Again, we're trying to be true to the game and true to the brand, and uh, including Daryl made, made the most sense uh, of all the characters in the, in the show, uh, as he's known to wander off on his own and, and help random people. Um, uh, yeah, uh, we are treating him very much as a non-player character, so he's helping you out in the camp. He is occasionally uh, tagging along to help you on missions. He's asking you or directing you to, to do things in the game's world to better survive. So you can think of him as a guide of sorts. Uh, we have been doing like more Daryl content towards the end of the episodes that we currently have out, and there's more Daryl incoming, as the fans seem to like it. Can I just uh, uh, add a question to that? Because I was thinking, uh, have you gotten any negative comments about this from, from players, uh, about including this character or his kind of involvement in the game? Are, because you, you talked about him being, uh, or Norman Reedus uh, being the voiceover for, for the mm. trailers and stuff mm. like this. So are people expecting more of, uh, of Daryl than they get? No, it, it seems to be very much in line with the players' expectations. Actually, um, uh, there's a fair number of people um, like asking for like that, seeing more characters from the show, which um, again uh, I don't think we are very likely to do, as that would more or less force us to focus on those characters instead of the players' own experience. Um, but like that's that's about the extent of it. And, like it, it seems to have meshed very well with what the players were expecting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a real shame. Like, uh, when we finally realize that it's going to become a problem, that people wouldn't want to let go of their beloved characters, even though they've outlived their usefulness, um, we didn't really stop to consider about the emotive side of that until it was kind of too late. Like, we had to go with what we had. And, uh, like, the mechanics make sense. Like, it, it makes sense to, like, progress to other characters and level them up and have one with fun, fun with, like, new people and so forth. But we really didn't stop to consider like um, players caring about their characters um, when we should have. And uh, like now it seems obvious, when we were making the game it wasn't obvious at all. And uh, yes, it, it's something we really want to alleviate some way or another. There's a bunch of options on the table, let's, let's see what happens. In the meantime you can do what some of the fans have been doing, so kill them off and have them recorded in your memorial. Oh, so yes. Just, they will force ourselves <laughs> to be bad, so. Well, uh, f for sure, like uh, AMC cares very deeply about like everybody working on the, like any show content, including our game, needs to be really familiar with the brand. And um, like when I joined, I hadn't seen all of the series at that, at that point. I've catched up of, of late. I've watched the new series as it airs, including the spin off. And, um, and so forth. So yeah, we are ab absolutely encouraging everybody in the team to be really, really into the uh, brand. So reading, reading the comic books and watching all of the show and, and so forth. And um, yeah, I, I think it uh, plays a huge part. So if we didn't do that, I'm sure that the fans could tell that like we don't know, we don't care about this brand as much as they do. It just would be apparent from all the small details being wrong. Um, at some point, like we realized that like not all of our like um, backgrounds were based on like show locations, and we just stopped to wonder like why. 
like they could be because there, there has been like plenty of places in the show. So we have now made it a point that every single new location you see in the game comes straight from the show. Like we can show you references. There's plenty of material out there. So we're now just making sure that we are using all of that. And the same goes with like outfits. Like there's plenty of clothes that the show's cast has been wearing. So let's just feature all of that. Um, weapons, let's not come up with new stuff there. Stuff that you've seen on screen, plenty of that. So let's just use all of that. Or like new walkers, like we're watching all the new episodes and seeing like, is there a new type of zombie in here? If there is, is that something we could use in the game? And, and so forth. So yeah, we are uh, paying a lot of attention to that. Um, I don't know if we can force anybody to become a fan, but like obviously when you're sort of sufficiently deep into something, you're going to care about it, like in no matter what you do. So on, on some level, I would say that we are all fans, yes. Well, you can only do so many things in a game. So we chose to do real time like RPG strategy well. So that's the only thing we do. Um, yeah, uh, like making a focused effort on character drama would have been a good alternative. Um, that's already taken. Telltale did it so well. We didn't see any point in like um, having like our first go go up against that. Like when they've had a chance to practice for I don't know how many games at that point. So like why, why be number one, number two when you can be, be number one? And um, yeah, it, it's also it's just hard. Like making that fit into mobile is not straightforward at all. Like trying to make meaningful short sessions, uh, trying to make especially content that you don't run out of is, is very hard indeed. Like I personally thought a lot about like how to make like non-violent drama based around characters without writing it all out in, in advance. It's not easy at all. Um, there are considerable uh, blocks in the way. If you come up with a way, do share. I would be interested to hear. Could you tell a bit about the next games, about the size of your team and mm. the Oh, for sure. Um, next games has been at this for a mm, couple of years now. Um, our first game was Compass Point West. Um, which was released globally earlier this year. Um, it's a Western themed uh, real-time strategy game. Um, one of the only, if not the only Western themed game on like the iOS app store, which is just baffling to me. Um, it, it's doing well on its own right. And then we established a second team to start work on The Walking Dead once we got the license. And um, we are now, as said, um, I believe 65 plus contractors up around 75 in total. We have a, the team is based in Helsinki, downtown Kampi area. Um, we are now working on these two games and starting production on a third secret one at the same time. Um, we've got um, investors um, from, uh, well, abroad basically. Like AMC, uh, who owns the Walking Dead um, property, is, is an investor also in the company. So it's not a traditional like developer publisher type setup, but rather we are like actually partners in this. And the Walking Dead team is around 20 something. I want to say 22, let's say 22. Okay, I guess we should stop again. Thank you. mention now that our game students uh, we're going to an excursion to next games uh, in January so uh, or actually February maybe start of February to be exact so you'll hear more about next games then and um, thanks for everybody for all these lectures it's been a good autumn and uh, more interesting stuff coming up in spring uh, our next lecture will be if I remember right 18th of January and um, yeah, I'll, I'll see you then. But uh, now as normal, refresh.
refreshments behind the corner, come dis discuss more. And uh, thanks also for everybody watching the stream. And we'll continue in January. Cool. See you. Hyvä, kiitos.